Welcome to the Ghost Are Near show, where we discuss and explore paranormal phenomena. I am your host, Keith Johnson, the co-founder of New England Anomalies Research. And today, I will be interviewing none other than Scott Walter. You will recognize him from the TV show America Unearthed on the Travel Channel. And he is a forensic geologist and author, along with his wife, Janet, co-historian and researcher. And we also have their son, Grant. Grant, it's nice to have you today. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Thanks All for right. you, Scott, it's such an honor to have you two on today. Well, thank you so much. Um, we're, we're excited to be here, and I, I have to say that um, I'm, uh, it, it's going to be extra fun having Grant here with us. So That is great. And, and he's a structural engineer, so if there's anything that uh, ventures into that territory, I'm going to defer to him. Oh, I'm sure we will. I'm sure we will. <laughs> okay. And I'd like to mention your new book, Cryptic Code of the Templars in America. See? You can get a shot of that. Yes. It's your newest book, correct? Yep, it's been out about two months, two and a half months. Oh, very good, very good. I love the color, the cover and everything, the colors, and I can't wait to get into it. <laughs> well, it's pretty good. I, I, actually, I think it's the best uh, work I've done. I, this is the fourth book I've done um, with this subject matter of Templars in America, and I, I think it's the best, so mm -hmm. I, I think you'll enjoy it. Oh, thank you. If thank not, you don't tell much. me. <laughs> uh, well, I, the Templars in America, that's a fascinating topic. It is. A lot of people want to learn about and want to know about. Right. Now, you've had many experiences in here in New England. Oh, I've spent a lot of time here in New England because um, as part of this research that for me began actually 20 years ago in this coming July, I can't believe it's been that long, but it started with the Kensington Runestone, and then I went over to Scandinavia trying to track the origins of the inscription. And it's a long inscription carved in rune, runes. It has numbers, it has Latin letters, but essentially what it is is it's a land claim. It says acquisition, business, or taking up land. So somebody came here claiming land, and the question then became, who did it? Where did they come from, and why did they come here? And so that led me over to Scandinavia, and I spent a few years over there finding all the elements that had not been found up to that point, and it was then that I realized the people that had carved this were the Knights Templar, the medieval Knights Templar. And of course, if you know anything about the Templars, they were persecuted by the King of France, oh, yes. yep. about, by the Roman Catholic Church, and in 1307, they were suppressed, and everybody thought that they had disappeared. Well, that is not the case. They did not disappear. Mm -hmm. They just went underground and eventually turned their attention over here to North America, and um, the base of operations was in the Northeast right here. So that's the reason I've spent so much time here. Wow, well, that is truly fascinating. Now, the Narragansett Rune Stone, Templar in origin, correct? Yes, mm -hmm. and the key to the Narragansett runestone, which was found off Pojack Point, which is just south of here a little bit, where we're sitting right now, and um, I'm going to actually be meeting, after we have this interview, we're going down to see where the Narragansett runestone is now, mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to meet with some of the, the uh, council uh, members of uh, North Kingstown. Apparently, the city engineer is going to be there, and some of the retired folks that remember artifact going back to the 1940s. But what I want to talk to them about is they've done a great job of, first of all, accepting the artifact, secondly, building a shelter to protect it from the weather, which we recommended to them. Right. And now I want to try to convince them that they need to put up some fencing around it, uh, security fencing, to protect it from alteration, or I should say from vandalism. Mm -hmm. Because just yesterday, Grant and I were up at America Stonehenge, mm -hmm. uh, a fantastic, mysterious uh, site that's pre-Columbian that was uh, vandalized uh, a couple of months ago uh, by a, a, an ultra-right-wing right group. And we went up to look at some of the repairs that had been done. But I'm going to talk to them in uh, North Kingstown about protecting it from... All it takes is one person, right, to destroy a historical it's, artifact. Yeah, sad and, what, true. and whether we know everything about it or not, it doesn't matter. Um, we'll learn things in the future, and we will solve all the mysteries of it. But until that time, we need to protect it. 
Yes, and Sandra and I have uh, experienced that historic sites in Rhode Island and in New England and the whole area. You get a cemetery, historical cemetery, that has a reputation for haunted phenomena. Right. Pretty soon people are knocking over gravestones, right. chipping away at things, taking mementos and uh, right. sacrilege and things like that. So. Well, and, and you'd like, you, you want to believe that people know better and they yes. understand the respect and... and um, this, you know, the sacredness of these things, and and sadly, um, like I said, all it takes is one to ruin it for everybody else. Mm -hmm. Hey, now another th location that is very close to my heart personally, the uh, Newport Tower, <laughs> Newport Tower, and its connection, a possible connection to Prince Henry. Well, if you talk to the local indigenous people, and uh, we're actually going to be. Uh, the chief of the Wampanoag tribe, this, that was their territory that the Newport Tower uh, now sits on. And in talking to Chief Black Eagle, uh, I asked him point blank, and I recorded it, who built this tower? And he said, Prince Henry Sinclair and the Templars when they came through here. And, you know, some people say, well, how would he know that? Well, if there's one thing I've learned about the indigenous people is don't question them if they even bother to tell you, because in most cases, um, they don't really care what white people think, right? right? For obvious reasons, the way we treated them, you know, at contact yes. and ever since. Mm -hmm. So if you earn their trust and they uh, deem you worthy of sharing this information, you better pay attention because they're telling the truth mm -hmm. and they know a lot. And, and so I think there's a lot to be learned there. Mm -hmm. Please describe the Newport Tower for our audience. Okay, well the Newport Tower is on the other side of Narragansett Bay from where we are right now. Um, it's at the top of the hill overlooking um, the harbor there um, in Newport, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And it's a two-story stone and mortar structure that is a round cylinder. The second story is a round stone and mortar structure that sits on eight columns that are evenly spaced with Romanesque uh, style arches. arches in between the, the columns. Um, and when you look at it, you know, some people have claimed that it's a colonial windmill. Yeah, and I've always um, wondered about that, how it could be a windmill and the structural integrity. I'm going to ask that uh, yeah. about Grant, if you could uh, explain that to us. Well, it probably would not be a windmill. Basically, if you think about a windmill, it's going to take a lot of lateral forces from the wind that it's designed to catch, right? Yeah. So rather than, if I were going to design a windmill, rather than build a bunch of columns with arches connecting them, I'd build a continuous wall because that's right. going to be much stronger resisting these lateral forces than these arches are. And not only are they weaker to resisting wind load, they're more difficult to build. So I really don't know why you would do that if it was just going to be a windmill. Right. Looks like it would crack apart. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it'd just push right over. Yeah. Well, you know, actually, that's a really good point. Um, and I didn't think about it until he just said it is, you know, it's, it's actually beautiful when you look at it. Mm -hmm. and, and not coincidentally, in my view, if you look at Templar architecture, uh, medieval Templar architecture, uh, in some of the most sacred places to the Templars, like in Portugal, mm -hmm. uh, there's a Templar castle in Tomar, where inside the church, the altar is a two-story octagonal shaped tower on eight heavy uh, columns with Romanesque arches. Mm -hmm. um, you also see it in Cistercian uh, monasteries, um, what they called the lavatorium, which is where the monks would go to bathe every day, uh, the three meals, and it was a sacred thing. So these are very important sacred structures. And if you go back to Jerusalem, Mm -hmm. And you look, uh, that's where the Templars controlled the, the Temple Mount uh, back in the 12th century. You see this same sacred architecture there. So to, in my view, this is where they got it. Mm -hmm. They used it in their own sacred structures. And eventually when they came over here to establish the first settlement in the New World or the uh, New Jerusalem, as they called it, they built this tower. Now, the question is, if it's not a windmill, then what is it? Mm -hmm. Well, first and foremost, it's a chapel. Um, you know, it's a sacred place where they would worship. Uh, I didn't say church. Okay. Chapel. Chapel. Um, and it's also uh, been known to, I mean, we've documented numerous 
solar, lunar, and other astronomical alignments. It's mm -hmm. basically an observatory. And the question is, well, if it's a windmill, why would you incorporate all these other things? And in addition to the structural things that Grant talked about, there's a fireplace in it that has northern Scottish twin flu mm -hmm. architecture for the smoke to be vented out the side. Why would you build a fireplace inside of a windmill that's grinding grain, right? Doesn't and make you, much sense. It would blow up. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, it, exactly. it, it, you know, there's really no evidence to support the fact that it's a windmill. And I think part of that is uh, there are forces out there that really don't want this Templar hi uh, history to come out. The church is one of them. Mm -hmm. There are certain political interests that don't want this. And historians that have already hitched their wagon to the um, windmill theory are reticent to, to go down that road that uh, might even be sacrilegious to their, uh, you know, to their disciplines. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate, but I don't have those constraints. I look at the evidence and I go where it, where, where it takes us. And that's where it's taken us and to only them so this will all come out in due time um, there was some uh, historian that said to me one time history changes one death at a time uh -huh. um, right. maybe that's the way it used to be now with the internet and everything I think it'll happen hopefully in my lifetime right we'll see and uh, of course the solstice you can view um, the sunrise and what do you see well, this was something that, um, I, it's actually a co-discovery that I made with Jim Egan, who lives and has a store right there oh, across yeah. the street yep. from the tower. Jim. And yep. Jim's a very, uh, he's a really smart guy. He's a really good guy. I think he, he gets a little excited about his theory. We have a disagreement about it, but what I about Jim is we we agree to disagree respectfully and we're still really good friends and you know I know he's wrong he knows I'm wrong but uh, we'll see how that all plays out but the bottom line is is we agree it's not a colonial windmill it was built before that right and um, and really that's all that matters at this point um, the details will will you know they'll take care of themselves with time but um, it, it's important that, that we have people here that, and he's there every day. He sees people, anyone that even looks like they're interested in the tower, he'll walk up and, and yeah, talk to yeah. them. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's good to have that. And we're both singing essentially the same song and, and it's the, it's the right song. Mm -hmm. And so, um, tomorrow morning, which is the winter solstice, uh, December 21st, which ironically happens to be my birthday. Yes, happy birthday, Scott. <laughs> right. Happy birthday tomorrow. And, and what happens is uh, there's a, uh, um, a window in the south of the, of the tower that will create a light box. When the sun comes up, it'll shine inside. And at 8 o'clock in the morning, the uh, light box will actually go through the west, uh, excuse me, the southwest window. There's another window about a quarter turn. And that alignment is at eight o'clock. Then the light box, as the sun moves, you know, west and and higher in the sky as the day progresses, at nine o'clock that light box will frame out an egg-shaped keystone, which just happens to have megalithic dimensions. It's 12 inches wide by 20.625 inches. When you add those two together, that's 32.625 inches. If you divide by 12 inches, that's 2.722 feet. That's an ancient uh, megalithic measurement that um, is not a coincidence. In fact, Stonehenge is built using the megalithic yard and many other ancient structures, which begs the question, if this is a windmill, why didn't they use the British foot, right? Yeah. Why did they use an ancient measuring system? Because the Templars had that ancient knowledge and mm -hmm. they used it in the tower. But at nine o'clock, that egg will be framed out by the light. It's a light tan colored granite egg shaped uh, mm -hmm. keystone, the only true keystone in the tower and it will light up beautifully and uh, Jim was the first one to take that photograph, but he didn't understand what it was. I understood what it was, and I said, Jim, I know what that is. And uh, anyway, we, um, uh, that following uh, winter, it was two months after he showed this photograph, um, that I went to the tower and I documented it, and it was amazing.
Wow. That is truly amazing, truly amazing. So estimated <clears throat> age of the Newport Tower. Well, if, if I had to put money down right now, I would say circa 1400, mm -hmm. because Earl Henry uh, Sinclair came here in 1398, and he left um, over 140 nights all told in two trips he took, 1395, 1398. And uh, one group was sent down to Narragansett Bay to establish a settlement. And I think what they did is they probably laid out the alignments on the ground first before they built the tower. And that probably took a year or two or maybe more. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I think they built the tower after that. Now, what happened to that colony uh, is unknown. Did they assimilate with the natives? We know that they got along very well with the natives. The natives have told us that. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, that's, that's an interesting question. But I think at the end of the day, if you're, if you're in another a place like this, you're probably going to assimilate with them. Mm -hmm. You're not going to convert them to your European way of, of life. And, right. and, and indigenous people live in balance with their environment better than any culture I know of. So I'm sure the Templars realized that that was the way to go. Right, and, and of course, there was the horrors of King Philip's War in right. the 17th century and everything. Yeah. I know uh, our director and good friend Nathan has, uh, Nathan Mayer has been there to witness the uh, solstice of the sunrise there at the Newport Tower with you. Yeah, it's, you know, it's it, it, what's interesting is when I first documented it in 2007, I was all by myself. And um, it was strange because for the whole, almost hour that I was there. And I, what I did was I had a tripod of taking pictures of the light box, you know, mm -hmm. progression, so I could, and I published those pictures. Um, not a single soul came by, and that never wow. happens. There's always somebody there. Now, this was before anyone knew about the illumination. This was right. the moment that we figured it out. But it was really a, a, a magical moment for me, and it was really an epiphany and a, and a validation, if you will, of everything that I had worked on mm -hmm. up to that point and um, so it was really a special time and then I published it in 2009 well now it's become a pilgrimage uh, yes you know for, yeah. for people to come a gathering there every year so there's gonna be a lot of people there tomorrow I've had a, a, a photograph already sent today somebody was there this morning and sent me a picture and said hey you're, you're you know you're gonna be here tomorrow I said yes so I'd like to just say to the Sun God would you please be there tomorrow in right. the clouds? <laughs> <laughs> yep. too bad um, didn't know you when uh, we got married Sandra and I were married in 2001 of course it was in the summer too but yeah. uh, we had our honeymoon picture taken in front of that oh no, did you in oh, the tower oh yeah certainly, certainly well you know what's funny is a couple years ago we were here for the solstice and we went into the there was a party in the house right across the street, and we went in there, and they, actually they came out to the tower. We talked. We said, oh, come on in, have a, have a drink, and, and they're serving food. So they invited us. We went in, and the, the wedding party, this was after the wedding, they had had the service inside the tower. Really? They got married inside the tower, and this was the after party, but we got there. We didn't see the ceremony, mm -hmm. but they showed us pictures. I have one of the pictures. So, so people are actually getting married inside the tower. And, That's cool. And I, I, I think it's great that people are embracing that, and um, like I said, it's only a matter of time before it's accepted for what it is. And, and it's not a small thing because, you know, everybody looks back and, and thinks that, you know, the beginning of the founding of the country started in 1776. Right. Well, obviously, that was an important time. But really, the beginning, in my view, started in 1362 with the Kensington and Runestone land claim. Mm -hmm. And those medieval Templars were practicing rituals that are the same rituals that we as Freemasons practice today. And I know for a fact that the medieval Templars passed the obligation of finishing the job mm -hmm. of establishing what they called back then a free Templar state that we now call the United States of America. Mm -hmm. Wow, fascinating, fascinating. Makes sense, doesn't it? It does, it does, yeah. it truly makes sense. And Getting back to the uh, Sinclairs. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, Westford Knight. Yes, the Westford Knight. Um, well, the Westford Knight, um, and, and I, you know, some of the people in the area might not be too happy with me when I say this, but look, the facts are the facts. Um, they, some people want to claim that there's a full knight there that's carved with the head and the shoulders and the, mm -hmm. and the chain mail and the coat, and then a shield, supposedly with the gun clan coat of arms. That's, that's BS, pardon mm -hmm. my French. But <laughs> what is there is a beautiful medieval sword. 
And if you want to make the claim that you have uh, a carving that represents a fallen medieval knight, all you need is a sword. I have been to preceptories that have Templar grave slabs and carved on there is a sword. Now, mm -hmm. there's also a, a, a crack in the sword which, in, which indicates a fallen knight. Mm -hmm. And you actually have that on the glacial striations that they took advantage of for the blade. Mm -hmm. And you have that right there. So, um, is it, you know, does it symbolize and date back to a fallen Templar knight that was with um, Earl Henry Sinclair's party that, of Templars that were here? It could very well. Do I know that for sure? No. Do I want to believe it? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it could very yeah. well be. Right. And of course, now they have the whole effigy there. That's the, the bronze uh, casting that was put there of the knight um, with the sword done by uh, David Christiana, and he did a great job, and mm -hmm. uh, and it's a great sight. And you know, if if you're a type of person that feels things when you're at a place, and there are people that have very strong feelings like that, as you know, mm -hmm. um, many people say there's 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 good energy there. All I know is there's definitely a sword, and it, it could very well, as far as the weathering, date back to that time period. Yes, and uh, of course, America's Stonehenge. Touch upon that. And yep. You were there as well, right? Yeah, we were out there yeah. yesterday. Yeah. I, you know, I, I'm. I, if I can ask Grant sure. a question, sure. you know, I've been there many times, and we yeah. filmed episodes there. This is really your first time as an adult there. We took him when he was little, but what'd you think? Well, it's unlike anything I've ever seen really here in America, as far as you know, archaeological sites. It doesn't look like anything I've seen that's Native American in origin. Well, I, the natives, the natives said, well, yeah, they said, they they said this, this is place is haunted. He said, we didn't, we didn't do this. And the, alli the alignments are fascinating, too. Yeah. There's, there's so many different spots out there. It was some kind of calendar site, but I, I really don't know what to make of it. I, I want to know who made it. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, you didn't walk around and say this is a bunch of baloney, right? Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was cool. I don't know what... I don't know how it could be baloney. I, exactly. I, I, it's, it's, it, you know, it, it's, it's amazing on one hand, but it's, it's, it's a little bit sad on the other hand. And what I don't understand is why acad academics aren't jumping all over this site, trying to understand what it is. And, and I know that we, we know the owners very well. They are wonderful. They came to my lecture last mm -hmm. night. They drove all the way down an hour to attend my lecture. And, and they're really good people, and they would welcome any researchers, you know, legitimate research uh, researchers that would want to come and do work on the site. And I just don't know why academics don't take advantage of it. I mean, they could make their careers with the discoveries that could be made there. You're such a treasure, right? So many treasures right here in New England, you and, know? And, and everything is, you know, it's at the highest point in the area. You've got these stones that now, arche you know, we can use archaeoastronomy and look at some of the alignments that are there. And they're actually not quite lined up perfectly anymore because of precession things have moved off a little bit and if you go back you can actually uh, retro age these alignments when they were perfect and they're not hundreds of years they're thousands of years right. so like you know two to three to four thousand years some of them so so not colonial uh, no. <laughs> right. So, so it's, it's, it's a little bit sad, and I guess all I have to say is, you know, what have you got to lose? And if people criticize you, then, you know, tell them to put up or shut up, and, right. and, and let's, let's get after yeah. it and figure out what it is. And um, it's important, and it needs to be studied. Yeah, we even have Cumberland Night right here in Rhode Island. Absolutely. Cumberland, you know, geologists <laughs> can come from all over the world and find Cumberlandite right here in Rhode Island. Well, I have some pretty good pieces, let me tell you. I've, I've, I've uh, actually been given some pieces that, that collect, have collected pieces. And, uh, of course, in the south column of the Newport Tower, yeah. about yeah. three and a half feet off the ground is a great big chunk, and it's, it's facing the, the uh, south side, and it begs the question, was that a coincidence or was it intentional? Well, I choose, it has magnetic properties. It has very high magnetic magnetic properties, and I choose the latter. I think it was intentional. Right. Okay, great. Now, you know what I really like, the idea of uh, you and Janet going out and, and Grant, too. Are you doing more of that, like as a family, going out and exploring? Well, we've been doing exploring, getting out in the field ever since he was born, and yeah. his sister, what Amanda. Start. <laughs> I mean, I've dragged him into gravel pits. How many gravel pits? <laughs> the, only problem with, the only problem with bringing him along to pick agates, and that's our state gemstone. They're beautiful rocks, and I've been a collector for a long time. But when I, uh, there was one time I brought the kids, and he was only a 
about nine years old. And what, what was really upset me was he found a much better agate than I had ever found, and he <laughs> found it, and I'm like, Grant! <laughs> but no, he's, we've been bringing them out in the field for a long time, and, and um, you know, I, when they're kids in high school and junior high, it's like, oh, geez, that's dad mom stuff. But as he's gotten older, I think he's grown to appreciate it, and quite frankly, he's... He brings a level of expertise and a knowledge base as an engineer mm. that is actually really helpful. So now he's, you know, he's he's on the squad. Yeah, and as you as you well know, when you start discovering and uncovering these things, you kind of step on people's toes a bit. You know, <laughs> accepted traditional beliefs and. Well, you know what? That's um, that's unfortunate, <laughs> but you know, look, it, it, I. I problem doing it because my intention isn't to hurt anybody's feelings or you know tread right. on someone's sacred paradigm I'm, I'm a scientist I'm going about it in what I think is the best scientific way gathering evidence and I don't have time to worry about people's dogma I just don't and um, you know uh, my intention is not to offend so if you do get offended it's it's really your fault mm -hmm. that's the way I look at it right now what's ahead on the horizon for you besides the literal literal horizon tomorrow morning <laughs> seeing the solstice sunrise and uh, celebrating your birthday well done actually yeah. that's a nice segue yeah. <laughs> um, well you know we're, we're we're hoping that American Earth will come back uh, travel has decided to go 100% paranormal so that's not really a good fit for our show but um, other uh, channels are looking at it and to be quite frank with you I'm hopeful that we would get a series or a special that really investigates some of the new new research that we have in the book and I will also tell you I'm in the midst of writing another book oh, about okay. more secret documents that the world has not seen yet and this is incredible this is what I talked about last night mm -hmm. but these new documents I haven't talked about yet all I can say is buckle up, baby, because it's it's going to get even more fun. Wow. So you're going to uh, rewrite history as we know it? No, I. you know what? I don't think about it like that. We're not rewriting history. I think we're just getting the history right. Right. And well, that, that means, that's a good, good point, yes. And if you have to rewrite it, then rewrite it. Yes, very good. So let's just get it right. Yeah. So any um, great sites other than what we've mentioned here in New England and Rhode Island that you're going to see while you're here? Well, um, <clears throat> we went to well, we went to Bunker Hill and we saw the obelisk there, at the Battle of Bunker Hill. He had never seen that before. Yeah, that's really cool. I woke up this morning or uh, yesterday morning and my legs were a little sore. <laughs> We climbed the 294 steps to the top. Wow. <laughs> but, but as far as ancient sites, um, we're going to the Narragansett Runestone next, then we're going to Newport. But then uh, my wife, Janet, said, you better get your butt home for your birthday. So we fly home tomorrow at about 4.30 from Boston. And okay. we pick up an hour, so we'll get there just in time for dinner and a beer. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> yeah, brewski. That will always go down nice after a long day of investigating yeah. and traveling. Yeah. Well, I hope you can come back to our show sometime again. You know, it's been wonderful having you on. It always feels like we're just getting started. I know, and then it's time to go. But thank you so much for thank having us. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed it and appreciate you taking the time to, to hear us chat. And uh, we'll come back anytime you want. Great. I'm, I'm glad to know that. I'd like to get you into Warwick, Rhode Island, where we live. All right. I want to hear some of your stories. Oh, yeah. There's, there's quite a few and quite a few discoveries made just recently in the area of Warwick, Rhode Island. Sounds great. Um, famous Rocky Point, too. <laughs> okay. I'm in. Let's do it. Great. Grant, so nice meeting you and glad yeah, to have too. you on. That's a, an added bonus I, that you're actually um, on with your dad. And we want to get the whole family in. <laughs> yeah, we'll get okay. Janet next Janet's time. Yeah. Next time okay? The upcharge for bringing him will be minor, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, seriously. Well, okay. God bless. Good luck with your endeavors and safety. And we'll see you again soon, and we'll be watching. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And uh, have a great holiday, by the way. Oh, yes. Yeah, great holiday.